Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to tonight's event in the green room with the Saviour. I'm Candice Gordon, Head of Cultural Affairs at the Embassy of Ireland in Germany. Uh, we are thrilled that you can join us for tonight's event to get a deeper insight into this fantastic play. We are aware that so many of you are joining us from all across Germany and indeed around the world. So to get a, a better cultural and historic background to this very Irish play, this should help to bring some context to this great work. Uh, we invite you to ask questions throughout the event by leaving them either in the chat box if you're in the Zoom, raising your virtual hand if you are in the Zoom room as well, or you can uh, leave a comment uh, via the Facebook pages if that's where you're watching it, or indeed on Twitter via the hashtag, hashtag the Saviour. Before I introduce you to our moderator for the evening, I'd like to hand over to Ireland's ambassador to Germany, Dr. Nicholas O'Brien, to say a few words. Ambassador. Thanks very much, Candice. And good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to welcome you to In the Green Room with the Saviour. This is a post-show discussion presented by the Embassy of Ireland here in Berlin and our Consulate General in Frankfurt, along with our partners, the English Theatre Berlin, English Theatre Frankfurt and the English Theatre of Hamburg. Guten Abend, meine Damen und Herren. Ich freue mich sehr, Sie heute Abend zu in der Green Room with the Saviour begrüßen zu dürfen. Ein Publikumsgespräch mit der Veranstaltung, das von der Botschaft von Irland in Deutschland und dem Generalkonsulat in Frankfurt zusammen mit unserem Partner English Theatre Berlin, English Theatre Frankfurt und dem English Theatre Frankfurt präsentiert wird. Es ist das erste Mal, dass eine Theaterveranstaltung in ganz Deutschland von allen englischen Theatern präsentiert wird. Und deshalb sind wir sehr stolz darauf, ein Publikumsgespräch über diese wunderbare neue Aufführung The Savior zu präsentieren. It's the first time that a theater event has been presented across Germany by all the English theaters. And therefore, we're very proud and delighted to be presenting a discussion on this new production, The Saviour. We're very excited about this new great initiative, forging partnerships, and it's also breaking new ground for us. We see it as the first step in an era of presenting excellent Irish theatre to audiences across Germany. And we're delighted to have esteemed journalist and cultural commentator, Micah Kruger, as tonight's moderator. And you're very welcome, Micah. The Saviour can be described as a blistering new play from some of Ireland's top theatrical talents. It's written by Deirdre Kinnan, directed by Louise Lowe, starring Mary Mullen and Brian Gleeson, and presented by Landmark Productions. This exciting play charts the extraordinary shift in Irish social, political and religious life over the past 30 years. And just to mention, if you did miss the live premiere at Cork Midsummer Festival, you can still catch it for the rest of this week as video on demand. Now, Ireland has a history of creating and presenting great works in theatre, from John Millington Singh and Samuel Beckett to contemporary artists such as the team from The Saviour. We think that we boast a richness of talent in writing, performing and presenting a theatre to communicate great ideas and stories. And one could argue that this is a trait which we have in common with Germany. And through this affinity, we are able perhaps to deepen our relationship further. We believe that this new initiative and network of partnerships can create new channels for new Irish theatre in Germany. And we're grateful to our partners, the English theatres in Berlin, Frankfurt and Hamburg for their enthusiasm. So we hope you really enjoy tonight's presentation and thank you again to all our participants. Wir hoffen Ihnen gefällt die Präsentation und heute Abend. Vielen Dank and thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. And I would also like to echo your thanks to the English theatres in Berlin, Frankfurt and Hamburg for taking part in this first of its kind initiative. Now, tonight, I'm delighted to be joined by journalist and cultural commentator, Micah Kruger. 
Micah has been working with Deutsche Welle in the cultural department since 2003, presenting cultural news, reports and features, as well as Euromax, a weekly show that offers its international viewers absorbing insights into, into European culture and lifestyle. She also works freelance and has worked for channels in Germany such as MDR and RBB. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy to introduce to you tonight, Micah Kruger. Hello, Micah. <laughs> Hi, Candice. Thank you so much. Uh, and um, thank you for the ambassador for, for the perfect German. That was really good. Um, yeah, thank you to the Embassy of Ireland in Germany, to the Consulate General and the English Theatres for inviting me to host this great event. It's a great honor and a really great pleasure, especially because I'm German, not Irish. Um, yeah, and The Saviour is this new Irish play uh, that premiered this weekend, live from Cork Midsummer Festival. Uh, and we have already um, great reviews um, from the Irish Times, for example, the Irish Examiner, and especially from me myself. <laughs> and before I introduce uh, now the incredible talent behind the whole production, uh, who we are joining um, tonight, maybe for all of us as a quick reminder and for all of those who haven't seen it yet, um, here's a quick little trailer from the play. So am I going to the dogs all together at the end? Hopefully. Or is this right? I wonder will you tell me, Jesus? Your mind Maybe anymore. it's not coming, but we are talking on oh, this. I'm enjoying the fag. Yes, I am enjoying the fag. You smoke? Ah, huh? you were smoke. So why are you asking? Because you gave it up. I had a relapse. When? When do you think? For God's sake, man, will you let me get up and get dressed? Yeah, such an incredible play. And now I'm really honored um, to talk to the talents behind this production of The Savior. It's really incredible, moving. And I'm really looking forward now to talk to you all and to discuss in uh, greater depth this night. Um, and I will now uh, welcome the writer, Deirdre Kinnahan. Where are you? I'm here. Hey, Deirdre. How are, How you? are you? Very good, thanks. And with us tonight is also the director, Louise Lowe. Where is she? Louise, you can put on your camera. And Hello. we have also, Louise, are you there? I am here. Hello. Great. Great to see you. And a warm welcome also to uh, the actress Mary Mullen, a master of emotional roller coaster. <laughs> Absolutely true. And the producer is also with us, Anne Clark. Hello and welcome to all of you. And first of all, congratulations. For Thank this you. fantastic, you fantastic play. Thank you so much. And maybe the first question is to um, to you, Deirdre. Sure. So what was your inspiration for, for this play, for writing this? Um, I suppose it, it was, um, you know, it was uh, like a nexus of things, really. I mean, the truth is that um, I came across this story of a very devout woman who had befriended uh, a man like Martin. And I thought it was a most extraordinary relationship. And I thought it spoke to so much about contemporary Ireland. And I began to think about the, the, the woman at the center of it and what her life might be and 
why she was so convinced that she could redeem or, um, you know, uh, uh, bring this man into her life. And at the time, you know, it was 2018 when I started writing it. And, you know, we were just coming out of uh, an extraordinary period with the marriage referendum, with the um, the changes in abortion legislation after a long campaign. And I felt that Ireland was really kind of moving into a very progressive, secular place. And while a lot of us felt, you know, really kind of elated and comfortable and proud of that, I was very aware that there would be people kind of lost in this new world, lost in this new Ireland, who had been brought up in a deeply religious, Catholic, conservative uh, culture, and that, you know, every tenet of their life and their experience was kind of being washed away. And um, certainly, you know, for that kind of minority group, there's a great deal of uh, angst and anger and confusion. And whilst I don't necessarily agree with their politics, I do have an empathy that their lives were kind of stolen from them by this religiosity and piety that was kind of bet into the generation that the, uh, particularly the generation before mine, I'm 52 now. So, so um, it, it was kind of a swirl of, of events and thoughts. And, and really it was around that shift in Ireland. And I just felt that the story of this woman kind of could act as a kind of a, um, you know, kind of almost like a parable or a way in to, excavating the, the, the trauma that we as a nation uh, still reverberate with as a result of that brutal, you know, kind of piety that controlled every aspect of our lives. Yeah, but I think it's also um, a play about responsibilities, uh, res being responsible about what you're doing and what you're saying. Um, and yeah, Moira is not really, she doesn't feel responsible. Is it typical Irish or is it to do something with, is, is it her character or is it something to do with her religious background? Well, I mean, if you think about, you know, religion, you know, you know, the whole idea, you, you know, that it's so infantilizing. It actually, you know, it's all part of God's plan. You know, like the, the, this notion that we are not masters of our own, you know, kind of trajectory. And uh, I mean, th that's a deep, um, um, you know, tenet of, of Catholicism. And uh, I mean, while in one instance you can see, oh, that's kind of convenient, is it? You know, if you say something wicked to somebody that deeply upsets them, you blame a devil for taking your tongue, you know, or, you know, it, it, but similarly, if some great trauma befalls you, you don't accept that it's just bad luck. You think it's part of God's plan. And it's all the milieu of all of that kind of um, ridiculous uh, uh, thinking. Uh, and, you know, that has, has, has saturated yeah, this country. And, and the big difficulty in Ireland is that, you know, from the foundation of our state, church and state were intertwined. So our legislation was governed by this kind of, um, you know, religiosity and, and this thinking. And it's so, um, it's kind of so... Uh, you know, overbearing that, uh, you know, all of us have to live by the dictates uh, of a few, you know, and I think that that's something that I've always kind of wrestled with all my life. I don't um, um, deny people their faith. I know some people get great comfort out of their faith and, you know, more luck to them. But I don't see why I would have to live by that. So that, that, that you know, really difficult um, notion of, uh, you know, legislating through religion, it excludes, doesn't it? It excludes yes. those who are not of the same faith. And it is also 
to my mind, religion, no matter what uh, color it takes, it's all about control. It's all about controlling populations. And unfortunately, you know, the Catholic religion in Ireland, you know, um, uh, whilst uh, there are wonderful people in um, that institution and wonderful people who believe in it and love it, I, I think its influence on our culture and our society and our country has been malign. And an awful lot of people, there's been a lot of collateral damage. And I think as a country, we're finally beginning to address that with a series of tribunals and investigations into the brutality that was committed against women, children and men in, in various uh, um, uh, religious institutions in the country. Yeah, you know, I'm German, obviously. Um, you hear a little bit from my pronunciation. Uh, and uh, some things were not so quite clear to me. And I guess we have uh, some German viewers now. Uh, for example, the laundry system. Yeah. yeah. So She's talking uh, the, about that. M Moira is talking about that a lot in the beginning. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, so Moira, in Moira's story, you know, as a young girl, when her mother died and her father uh, went to England, her father put her into uh, what he believed was a school uh, run by the nuns in Stanhope Street. But what happened in Ireland was there were often these kind of education facilities that were interlinked with convents and mother and baby homes and laundries. It was like there was a whole industry you know around religion and part of that were the magdalene laundries and they were um uh, basically prisons for women who had had a child outside of wedlock women who were considered to be um, you know, temptresses, uh, maybe orphaned women, you know, young girls, uh, a lot of women with, with uh, intellectual disabilities and uh, a lot of unmarried mothers were basically um, brought into a, a mother and baby home to have their child, but then would often have to work off their time in a laundry. And they worked in these dreadful conditions, these kind of huge industrial industrial steam rooms where, where they, they, they worked for anything up to 80 and 20, uh, 20 hours a day. And um, it, it was just a big facet of Irish culture. And they were always in behind tall walls and everybody knew they were there. But nobody ever kind of bothered to, 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 to look in through the cracks of those walls and imagine the lives, the lost lives behind them. And, and quite recently, a lot of those Magdalene women, they weren't believed about the brutality and the cruelty uh, that, that was meted out upon them uh, within those institutions. And a lot of them ran away or escaped or, or were eventually, you know, kind of let out when, when they came to adulthood. And, and they just ran, they ran to the UK, they ran to the States or they ran to the country and they always carried this huge shame with them uh, because they were women of the Magdalene laundries. And as a country, we're only beginning to recognize the fact that these women were effectively incarcerated, used as slave labor, and brutalized in these institutions. And there was a moment where our Taoiseach, uh, Enda Kenny, uh, a number of years ago, kind of stood up in our government house and, and apologized to the women. So I had read a lot of books about the Magdalene Laundries, and there was one story in a book in particular um, called Whispering Hope, a woman called Kathleen Legg. And I took elements of her story and, and, and gave it to Moira, but there's a lot of testimony around now, and we, we've a good picture. And indeed, Louise Lowe, who directed the show, made a really seminal theatre production a number of years ago called Laundry, and it was a site specific production uh, in a laundry in Sean McDermott Street. And it was probably one of the most extraordinary theatrical experiences I have ever had. And um, so, hopefully, that gives you an idea of, of the world of it. Yes, thank you. And um, let us talk a little bit more about the main cast, Moira. Um, so, so she had a tough life, a, ch a tough childhood and a tough life. And um, Mary, maybe you can join us now in our yeah. discussion. Because yes, I was I mean, asking it's... myself, how did you manage um, to play Moira in a way that we 
first fell in love a bit with her because she's so cute and we think oh come on she should enjoy her little love story why not and in the end it's completely different yes so how are your feelings about moira well, I just, I mean, it's like we used to say in rehearsals, well, bring it on for all the Moras. Like everybody was so delighted by, by the chance she got to, to, to have, have a touch, to, to feel something so deeply for someone else um, and to feel alive again, really. Her children had left and there was, there was every, every uh, apparent, uh, it appeared that uh, things would be brightening up in her life for her and company and, talking and um, laughing and all the things that we associate with people living to the full in their lives and I, I think you 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 love that for her and the audience want that for her because because we get a, a sense as, as, as Deirdre was saying of of the life that she's had and the struggles that she's had and and all the things she tried to do um, to, to make herself fit into this world really and then it, it all sort of falls apart in, in the second half with the the, the great horror that might have happened to her and her family uh, because of this person you know so I think I think um what what Deirdre has done is she 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 starts off with Moira in the bed and she brings us we we go with her every because of the way she's written it we're with her all the way we're with her for the, from sentence to sentence from dream to dream from picture to picture and and she she just brings us in with the words and and um i think that that's why we get so involved in the whole story i mean it's a brilliant story and um and 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 then we're left to decide for ourselves like it's, it's like um d said it's it's their stolen lives you know the, the, those women had to obey the rules of Catholicism. And within that, they they gave up their right to think as individuals. You know, and I think that that's what happened to Maura as well. I mean, uh, the, the thing she says to Mel at the end of the play, it's she's obeying the rules of her religion, which she has believed in. Jesus, Jesus is the voice that never leaves, like the power of Jesus in her life. You know, it's just nobody, nobody can take that over. Mm. Well, the play uh, has the title, The Saviour. Um, do you think uh, it's for her, it's Jesus? Well, I think she feels, um, we've, we worked at this in, in rehearsal with Dee and, and Louise. We, she feels that because of her strength, because of her closeness to Jesus, that she might be able to champion Martin that he has returned to God, he has paid his dues, and now he has a right to live his life in the grace of God. She feels that she has, she, she can forgive him, you know, and that she can be his champion and, and that, that he, she can be in his life because he is now a good person. Um, I mean, she, she really believes that, you know? Yeah. Um, and you are... I'm sorry, Mikey, you've frozen a bit on me. She'll come back. She will. Uh, Is she frozen on anybody else? Yes, yeah, she's frozen yes. on me too. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting, though, isn't it, just in terms of the saviour? So the saviour is almost a colloquial name for Jesus as well in English. I wonder if it is in German as well. No, we still can't hear you. I hear you, Mike. Mike. Yeah. The biggest, biggest message. Ah, oh, we're back. <laughs> so, um, but now you hear me. Now I'm not. Yes. Yes. Okay. No, I was not mutant. Um, I think it's, I don't know, maybe it's the connection. I, I have no idea. I'm so sorry. Have you heard the last question? What's uh, for you the biggest strength of the play? Who's that for? For me? <laughs> yes, it's for you, Mary. I'm sure. I'm sure we all have different ideas. Um, <laughs> I think um, the biggest strength of the play. Um, well, it's it's the um, the complete darkness that she goes into in the end. I think, like Deirdre makes us look at that in a real way. I mean, you know, it it is genuinely a dark place because there is no other way to go. With this after what's happened um and and i think i i find that i find that brave and i find that um i find it true and and i think 
it's good for us as a theatrical to while we're watching it our audience to to embrace that that true darkness that comes and i think it's a lot of that's a lot of the strength you know yeah and uh maybe now louise as a director so this was quite a challenge to to bring this hybrid version on stage wasn't it um i i i loved it i'm sorry that i sound so wacky i'm in an empty classroom i apologize <laughs> everyone else has gorgeous surroundings but uh and i only realized now that i opened my mouth i'm echoey and it's it's not a big room and uh, i think there was there was so much to find in the play and so much to mine from from the brilliant script and the words that Deirdre had given to us that actually I, I didn't find it so much of a challenge. I mean, the hybridity and the challenge is actually making it work a little bit if people are watching remotely. But it's also very much like a love affair to a theatre and, you know, exposing that part of the theatre and the wings as we're going alongside the camera work was was it was a brilliant challenge and, and one that, that we kind of embraced from the beginning. And I think the difficulty in that challenge probably was to the performers in so many ways in that there's no energy coming back at them. And, you know, the force of an audience, the the, the movement of it, the kind of kinesthetic responses that are going on, the, the whoops and the ahs. And, and I think that was probably the biggest challenge, you know, at the end of wringing themselves out emotionally and purging themselves for, for 70 minutes. They only had me going in and going, well, how was that? <laughs> <laughs> to an empty theatre space. And I think that was that was really hard. Like, I can't imagine push, pulling myself upside down and inside out to have just me coming and <laughs> That was grand. Well done, lads. Like, <laughs> I, 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 well, you're so used to having that energy come back at you, you know. And I think, you know, live theatre gives us that opportunity in terms of feeding and feed, feeding from the audience's energy. But actually, I was talking to Mary about this the other day. The energy is in the ether. It's coming back at you some other way. And it's, it's not that it's not. Yeah. yeah sorry. Go ahead, Marie. No, we did learn how that it was. I'm just going to tell everybody how when when we finished and we did the, the bow at the end, that the theatre was so still. And then Louise no. burst in the door with the rest of her, her <laughs> yeah. outside and, and gave us a clap. And then we felt, oh, right, so somebody did hear. <laughs> it just felt more natural, you know. It was just this big silence in the theatre when we finished, know. you know. Not I that know. you're looking for applause or anything, but, you know, there, there's always another element there, you know. And... Uh, so it, it, was, it was a matter of getting used to the new structure, you know, the, yeah. the communicating with our audiences in, in, in a different way because of what's happened. And I, I think we were so fortunate in that we had Louise to do that. She, she not only directed the play and lived with the play, but that she made it happen for the, with the cameras as well, you know. Well, the pleasure was mine completely. I, I loved being in the rehearsal room with Marie and Breen and Deirdre and, and just the challenge of taking this new work and, and presenting it for the first time is, is huge and, and important. And I think it's an important and timely piece of work. And I think in so many ways, I think the, the beauty of this play is in its, in its presentation now to an Ireland that has changed irrevocably, but still, as Dee says, has those bastions of, of religion and faith intertwined with our states, with our education systems with our medical systems. And I think we are only starting, we're only starting as a country or as a culture to, to unravel that for ourselves. And that's the joy of this play, I think. Absolutely. And talking about uh, the audience and missing the audience, we have already a couple of questions now here. Uh, and um, because um, the next question should be for Anne Clark, um, because uh, I wanted to ask you anyway something. Um, about the, the, the production and how difficult it is for you. Um, here's the question from Mary Koo in the Zoom chat. Um, is there any hope of it being performed live in person when the country opens up a little bit more? Uh, well, the short answer is yes, there's lots of hope. <laughs> there's lots of plans. Um, we're gonna have to wait a little while. Uh, because Marie is heading off shortly to, oh, is that announced? Can I say that? I can say that. It was announced today, I think, <laughs> is heading off to, to do a show on Broadway in the autumn. Mm. So, yeah, so we have to wait until, until she's finished with that. But I think, um, I think one of the extraordinary things that Louise did um, in, in directing the play was she, she directed it as a play and you're never, you're never not clear that you're watching a play. And yet she managed to direct it for camera at the same time. It's a really 
unique and sort of very d- dynamic hybrid. But it means that when, when hopefully we come to do it in real life, um, that like the performances, it's been directed as a play. So the performances have been all the work that Marie and Brian have done um, will help when we come to to do it in real life. And and uh, it is really interesting this time we're in because of COVID and we have all learned to to work in a different way and to reach audiences in a different way. Um, and the live streaming has been a fascinating process and a, a wonderful way of reaching audiences you never would have been able to reach before. Um, and for example, we're having this conversation now, you know, this collaboration with the three English theatres in Germany is, is unique. It hasn't happened before. Mm. Um, so I think there are all sorts of doors that have been opened um, and I think the live streaming will continue and equally I think everybody is desperate to get back into a theatre they, like the act- actors audiences we cannot wait, wait. To, to, to perform oh, yes. to, to real life audiences so yeah bring it on <laughs> <laughs> but, but hopefully the door will not close completely Uh, hopefully uh, those kind of hybrid uh, productions uh, can be realized in future as well this is what I hope because in this way I can join you when you are playing in Cork that's brilliant and I have another yeah no sorry I was I was going to say that's exactly right and that you know when we did a, a show earlier in the year the approach uh, by Marco Rowe, we, we had people joining us from 44 countries, wow. but also people, it's not just from people who are remote geographically, but even people who have, you know, family commitments, who have young kids, you know, who live in different parts of the country. So there is tremendous access. And this is one of the really good things that has come out of COVID. And one of the things that we, we absolutely will keep. And, um, and Landmark Live is absolutely here to stay. And I'm planning that every show we do from now on, we'll have will have some sort of live filming element to it. That's great. That's great. Because there are so many possibilities. Uh, mm. I have another question. Uh, this goes to the director. Uh, it's from Constanza Luhmann. And, sh- and she is writing, I'd love a comment from, director, from the director about the ending of the play. Spoiler a lot. We have to be <laughs> really careful about that. Um, for those who haven't seen it yet, of course, thanks. She would like to talk a little bit about the ending. This is what I guess. Uh, hi, Constanza. Thank you for, for your question. I suppose the end, the play for me exists in three parts and uh, I like a triptych, like a triptych of pictures or, or moments that kind of go together, movements, I suppose. And in loads of ways, the end piece is the shortest part of that triptych, but is separate to the first two in that, you know, we see glimpses and snatches to write the first, the first two movements or motions where, where, where Moira does retreat back to that place in Stanhope Street and does retreat back to, to, the, to the very dark side of her, of her upbringing and, and her experiences that Deirdre talked about at the beginning. We got reflectiveness back at, at the child, and we and we looked at that age that that Moira was probably in those institutions from, and two, and they're quite formative years, um, you know, between the ages of probably nine or ten and sixteen, you know, where where you're going through puberty, where there's lots of other stuff happening. So for us, her 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 disassociative way of coping with that trauma in the body was to go back into retreat. And in lots of ways, that darkness, like many of the women that would have come through the Magdalene system, and indeed lots of people have come to the system of abuses in Ireland, they would carry that trauma in their bodies and in their mental health and in their well-being. And that's been documented time and time again. And I think what Deirdre has managed to capture brilliantly is the weight of that trauma onto the everyday. And so for us, that, that, part, that third part of the triptych really was about her sinking back of something happening in the now that forces her to sink back into the then and to be, be consumed by it. And I think the words that myself and Marie used in rehearsal, Marie, correct me if I'm wrong, was that infect, being infected back by it and seeping back to her body. So it is her own making. It is herself that she's afraid of. And the darkness is from inside herself, but it's also what's been done onto her, what she's held in her body, what's been held in that muscle memory. I remember re- listening to Brendan Kennelly talk about this a number of years ago. Um, the, and he was saying that it takes you know, nine generations for us to process a trauma in our bodies. And that ge- intergenerational trauma carries. And if that's the case, we have, and that's nine mammies ago, right? So we haven't even begun 
to even process the fun. So it's, you know, people like Maura and those very damaged, brittle souls who are carrying all that weight and all that, that stuff with them. It, it comes out somewhere or they retreat back into it because it's what they know. And for me, Constanza, the ending and working with Marita and, and, and it was already written in the script. We didn't have to create it. Let's face it, Deirdre. You, you gave it to us as a gift. Um, <laughs> it was about her being consumed by that trauma and by her actions and by the grotesque, grotesqueness of her actions in that middle section that she has to confront herself, confront her past and confront her worst fears of, of what's in front of her, actually, and without giving too much to play away. And no, and that truth and that confrontation with the truth finally to realize that, you know, um, the darkness is, is right there. I have another question. Uh, I was asking myself this role of Martin, the guy who is not showing up um, without spoiler a lot, sorry. But um, why, why Martin? Maybe, maybe this is a question for Deirdre. Why, why is this, this role of Martin there? Um, well, as I said, uh, you know, it, it, it comes from a truth. You know, I came across the story of, of um, a very devout lady who um, you, it, it had a friendship and a relationship with such a man. And it proved very difficult within the family dynamic. And um, so, so that was the, 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 the spark. Now, obviously I recreated who that woman was and who the family were, but it made perfect sense to me because men like Martin are predators and men like Martin um, uh, see vulnerability and they groom people. Um, particularly if they think that by grooming or, um, you know, kind of invading their psyche, that it will give them access to children. And um, so the story made perfect sense to me. And um, I also thought it was really interesting then when you dig deep into the notion of that relationship, that you wonder who's right and who's wrong. Is Moira really a wonderful person for forgiving? Um, because in a sense, I really admire that ability in her to love and forgive uh, a man who has committed past sins, now served his time and come at the other end. But then the other side of that is, if this man still presents a danger to her family and her grandchildren, well, where do we land on that weighing scale? So, and as a human being, I believe in rehabilitation. I believe in a secular way, not necessarily in a religious way, that um, everybody should be given a second chance that innately people are good, that some people commit heinous crimes, but they should be given the opportunity to, um, you know, to, to, to move on from that place and reach another part of their humanity, be it through a prison system or counseling or whatever. So I really believe that, as does Moira. Um, but at the same time, sometimes you come face to face with your own notions about yourself or what you want to believe about yourself. And you think, but if that was pitted against the possibility of somebody endangering or harming my children or my family, where would I land in there? So it was just like this fabulous, complex uh, um, um you know, relationship that could unleash and unearth and allow us all as a community and a society and an audience to grapple with notions of forgiveness, rehabilitation. Like, I think Moira says at one point, why? Why is it different for Martin? And maybe in that instance, Moira's right. Why is it different for Martin? But then you also kind of go with Mel because he's a danger, you know? So, so, uh, so, so that's a huge theme in the play as well. And it's kind of the last frontier, isn't it? 
you know. Um, and I mean, there are men and women who have committed those kind of crimes who do go into counselling and rehabilitation services and, and hopefully come out the other side and are able to, to live in the world, do you know? So it's a big, complex, uncomfortable um, conundrum, but it exists. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing is that we're just putting it out there uh, quite brilliantly in terms of performance and, and, and theatre and, and asking the audience and the world to engage uh, and discuss. Yeah. Well, this is why I love um, this play so much, because you give us this really uh, difficult questions to think about. And I was thinking about the whole night when I saw it. Saw it. Um, but let us talk about uh, the other role of a man in your play who was really showing up. Uh, and we haven't talked about him so much, about Brian, but he's also an amazing actor. And we have a question from uh, one of our viewers. It's Pak Mastrani, uh, and he's from the Zoom chat. Uh, the relationship between mother and son was heartbreakingly written and performed. So do any of you think we can hope for any sort of rapport between them in future, or is that just wishful thinking? <laughs> this is from Pak Mastriani. And uh, do you want me to, to, to answer that? And then maybe Marie can come in as well. And... <laughs> maybe, maybe Marie can answer. It. Marie, yeah. Um, yes, what, what exactly are we going to be, what, what, what exactly do you want me to I tell you? you? I, I give you um, the question in my own words. He yes. want to see you on stage together. Oh, and he both hopes so that you will do this. Uh, oh. And he, he's asking, will this happen in future or is this just wishful thinking? Because he, 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 he think I your, your play was really heartbreakingly written and performed. Well, that's, that's a lovely thing to say. And we do appreciate all of that. But yes, I would think so. I mean, um, the, the rehearsal room was... Um, was a very safe place for us for this play um, and and we knew that from the start because there's sometimes the, it was very disturbing working with this this material but for myself and Brian we just we just felt safe just just um, exploring the, the the differences between uh, the two of us and I think we did we did have a we definitely had a such a big huge connection and um, like, um, like as two people as two actors and also as the characters in the sense that Louise said to us one day that we're we're just missing each other we're just trying to communicate and yet every, we're just not we're not connecting like that we're just sliding off each other and that's it and that that was a great help to us as a as a concept uh, through the play because each of us wanted to be uh, uh, be on the same page with the other as as the characters to, because we loved each other we love each other and um, and yet it wasn't it wasn't happening and I think that's yeah. part of the friction between in the play between us and also but part part of the longing the yearning for us to have a meeting a meeting space is is, is another thing that keeps people um, kind of fixed with us and the words and and all that you just can't believe you just think maybe the next time they'll connect and everything will be all right but and and so you keep going on the journey with them and they don't and I think uh, you know Brian's sensitivity because of his he's he's extraordinarily powerful on stage as a as a young as a young actor as a young man and and the words that Deirdre gave him um he he was able to inhabit them so beautifully and so honestly, and and the relationship with his mother, um, he, you know, the, the, you you can feel his trying all the time, his trying to protect her, trying to you know to you can feel his energy all the time, and you stay with it because you want him to succeed, and then you're watching her and you want her to be all right. So I think that's the magic of the thing, and I hope we do it together again. I mean, there's every reason why we would. You know, and, and I'd love to have it on a live stage. I'd love to, to be able to do it um, with a with live audience. And just, just to come in there, yeah. if, if I may, just uh, having a quick look at, at Peg's question there as well. If Peg is, is wondering whether um, Mel and Moira 
will ever be together again in the world of the play. That is something that we all discussed. And I did try and write it that this was an irreparable uh, tearing. This was a, an irreparable moment where, where their relationship would, would, would just never get back on its feet. But there was just something about the dignity of a man like Mel and something about that tenderness um, that we do see flickers of between them that made us kind of agree, didn't we, Marie, that poor yeah. old Mel he'll be back next week I think. Yeah. Mm. I have I have another question um, <laughs> because this this son I, he, he brings his mother a really special present to her birthday and it's a doll and could you tell me a little bit more about the significance of this doll? A son is giving his mother a baby. <laughs> mm, yeah, I suppose, but also, uh, I think, I, I always feel that he has listened to her so much when he was growing up. He has been, he has been, uh, you know, he has, she has seeped into him, if you like, we've often used that word. And, and he remembers those stories and she's probably told him about the story about the, the doll so much. Yeah. And he saw, it, 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 he's just such a sensitive, creative chap that when he, when he saw the doll with the, with the red, red flowers or with the pink flowers on the yellow background, the, the, he said, that's like the doll that my mother. Story, had. yeah. They took away from her on her first day and he just he just got it you know and um you know she had to be prodded to remember telling the story again and again which sort of is is a little hint of of the the distraction that exists in Maura's Maura's mental health me mental state you know in the sense that she is she has been very hurt and very wounded so always she doesn't make the same connections that we all do in our worlds so but 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 for for mel this this was he just thought that this was an act of love which it was really the dog you know and i would like to to bring you back in the discussion and um we all were asking ourselves um how did this all start with this play? How was the process beginning? How did the production begin? Gosh, yeah, it's been a uh, some plays take a while to come <laughs> to come to pass. So this play, Dee and I started talking about three years ago, I think, um, uh, uh, and I commissioned her to write. She told me the play she wanted to write. Uh, and I thought it sounded wonderful um, and uh, I commissioned her to write a play for Landmark and she started to write it um, and then this is Dee's story but you know so then something happened that derailed us for a while uh, uh, and then we were all set to to do it uh, last year and then this little thing called Covid came along and <laughs> put, put paid to all our plans um, and it, in a way that it, it was sort of typical, really, for a lot of people who work in theatre, you know, the, the, you know, there had been an entire production planned, like an architecture of, you know, how many weeks we would play in Dublin, maybe we could co-produce with a theatre in the UK, because we always had great ambitions for this play. And we felt it was a story that would, needed to be heard and would travel. Um, uh, but then obviously COVID happened. And then it literally, it was one of those... Um, I don't know if you know, there's a theatre in London called the Old Vic, which early on in the pandemic, they started to do um, plays on a bare stage in a very stripped back way, very technically not at all um, uh, uh, very sophisticated. They, they were doing it on Zoom. They were doing it with the really basic cameras. Uh, and Dee and I watched the first show and we found ourselves sitting down at three o'clock on a Saturday afternoon and the, you know, the voice came, please take your seats. And we got that little thrill of live theatre. And then this seemed to point a way to do plays in the current climate without having to have big sets and, you know, but to find another way to tell the story. Um, so, so that sort of idea of doing it on the bare stage of the Everyman which is a beautiful Victorian theatre in Cork, 
you know, amazing sort of, you know, wonderful plaster work, red seats. You know, we, we weren't trying to hide the fact we weren't that we were trying to acknowledge the fact that we were doing it in this very particular way. And then the idea of doing it, um, uh, well, then we were like, we were so grateful when we said she would do it. Um, and um, that, that made us feel as though we would find a way of doing it. And I, I don't know, sometimes actors don't, I don't know, maybe don't understand the power they have and they run towards something, you know, that they, like we wouldn't be doing it if Marie hadn't read it and hadn't responded to to Moira and wanted to bring her to life in, in all her complexity. Um, and, and then the combination of, of, of Marie and uh, Louise, who like there is nobody else in Ireland, I think, who under, would have understood the source material so immediately and so profoundly, and also had the, the theatre experience, but also the camera experience, because Louise directs for, for camera as well. Um, so, so between that and then the fact that the um, Cork Midsummer Festival, which is a wonderful festival. And when the world opens up, everybody in Germany must come to Cork. Um, <laughs> it's around midsummer in June. Um, uh, and they were just incredibly supportive. And they they said, please come and do it here. And they made it possible for us to do it. Um, so it's been one of those things. It's been a twisty road. But gosh, you know, we were all thrilled with 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 the privilege of being able to do it in this way at this time uh, and to be able to reach people people all over the world uh, including including in Germany for the first time I think you know it's in, like in Irish theatre we tend to look either um, east to, to to London or west to New York and it's wonderful to have this connection now um, so thanks to Candice and all the work with, that she's doing there so thank you for that. Yes thanks to Candice and uh, um how important was it then to show the German audience um, this part of the Irish soul? What do you think? But it um, is a part of, of the Irish soul, you know, I guess. Yeah, I think, I think everybody connects. I think the writing is so powerful and the relationship between the characters is so powerful that, you know, people may not understand initially about the Magdalen Laundries or a bit of, you know, whatever Irish history, but they can absolutely understand this woman and, and, and the trauma she's been carrying and how she then relates to her son and how, 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 how devastating it is for, for both of them. And I think, um, so, and I think Dee writes, um, the, the characters and the relationship between them both is so understandable and so universal, you know, in terms of mothers and sons, in terms of, you know, different competing values and, and trying to make your way in the world. And um, I, I, think, uh, I, I think the people who've watched the show so far, I mean, the they, things they, they're saying, they keep saying things like they were absolutely, it's gripping, it's riveting, it's incredibly powerful. They were blown away. So I think the play really sucks you into this incredible relationship uh, and doesn't let you go. Um, uh, and I, I hope the, the German audience feels the same way. I think Mike is gone again. It's just Mikey, you're muted, I think. Thank you. <laughs> oh, after one and a half year with COVID and Zoom meetings, it's still a mistake, which always exists, still exists. But it, it's really funny. But, but I wanted to say um, this religious background, which is quite typical for Ireland, um, but it's also, on the other hand, very international because it's not just typical Irish, isn't it? So there are lots of regions in the world who can connect with this. Oh, absolutely. And I think, um, you know, it's, you know, it's fundamentalism, you know, as I said, you know, yeah, I mean, like that whole idea of poor Jesus up in the highlands, you know, getting a bit of peace. I often think that, you know, the poor soul, the things that are done in his name and the nonsense, you know, which, you know, Bob Dylan has a brilliant song, you know, uh, you know, we have God on our side. Every army marches out into battle with this notion that they have God on their side. How many political leaders, you know, bring 
God and religion into their, you know, election campaigns. And, you know, and like really what they're just doing is mining people's vulnerability, you know? So, so, and, and, and like, the, as I said, that this is a play about so many things, you know, and it's a play about oppression. And uh, it's a play about delusion, the things that we tell ourselves in order to be able to live with ourselves. And it's a play about the, the eternal struggle that women have to, to maintain their liberty uh, um, and their rights within this world, because it feels sometimes like every battle is played out on their bodies, you know, and because we're back in a exactly. situation yeah. where, uh, you know, half the world is marching backwards in terms of, you know, um, uh, women's um, uh, personal bodily autonomy. And you have, you know, their access to contraception, education, and, um, you, you know, abortion being challenged again and again around the world. And and what is it about? You know, it's it, it's rarely about. I never believe it's about saving babies. It's about control. It's about placing yourself in a position of power, uh, and 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 um, you know, just all of that is playing out. But it's the Moras and the males and the poor soul Annie Cohen, who Moira talks to in the play, this ghost of a young girl who died next to her in a Magdalen laundry. There are the collateral damage. You know, mm -hmm. it's not the bishops, it's not the pre presidents, you know, it's not the big political heads, uh, you know, and, and, and it, it's very few men, you know. So I think through a very domestic uh, particular story, you can speak to huge themes within a country and, and with, within all societies. Yes, absolutely. And this trauma is not really, not so many years ago. So where are you now in Ireland? So I, I, I know it's progressing. The situation is different than it was a couple of years ago. Um, but how stable is the situation in your mind? Well, the last laundry closed in Dublin in 1996, in September yes. in 1996, which is such a short time ago. And and I, I remember looking at that time at those those last women that lived there and, and and meeting them and seeing them and then just watching a very, very small community of women who had both lived there as as nuns, as being part of the order and as women who had been incarcerated into that system. And now they were living collectively cheek by jowl as old women, as pensioners. And I'd watch them going down to collectively collect their pensions and buy sweets and and live very simple, very, very quiet lives. So I often thought looking at them both going, my God, what damage we have caused to both those sets of women, not just to the women who were incarcerated, but the women who were there and forced to carry out some of those instructions on behalf of the state. Because let's face it, our court system incarcerated those women. You know, our legal system incarcerated them as much as our medical system did. And I think I think now we are in a position whereby some of those women are still looking for reparations and for damages for all of those, that time spent. Some of those women are just happy that they got that formal state apology by Enda Kenny in 2013. Some are, some are still holding that secret and no shame, but all of them, all of them are profoundly damaged by it. And I think we are only coming to terms as a country, collectively as a society, with the collective amnesia that allowed that to continue and that allowed that to, to happen but actually happened in all of our names. Like we all knew it was there. We all knew it was going on. And I think we are coming to terms with what we've done onto ourselves. And I think Deirdre's play really does capture that in a microcosm of actually going, this is what we've done onto ourselves. This is where we have a place to go to heal. And lots of conversations have been that about redemption and hope and forgiveness and salvation and, and being our own saviors. And I think at the start of the play, you know, myself and we had great conversations. I've never had a rehearsal room like it in my life. I've never loved working with someone as much as he comes in that But it was just really the best time. Like, and uh, we had a great time. And I think the one of the first things that we decided was that at the start of the play, she has saved herself. You know, so she's become her own saviour. And it's within that then she is 
she is her savior, her own, you know, her own yeah. salvation. And and I think there's lots of ways um, that she tries to become that for other people in the, in the play and in her life. But actually, ultimately, the act of reclaiming her body, regardless about who, in that in that moment of reclaiming her sexuality, reclaiming her own body, is that moment of emancipation for her. You know, it's that moment that her body can bring delight and joy and power and passion and understanding that at that age, what, what, is, what a salvation, you know? Absolutely, absolutely. Here in Germany, we know very well that a trauma um, is always passed to the other generation and maybe you have it in your next and the next and the next generation. It keeps going and going and going and uh, it's working in every generation. Um, what are you doing in your generation to cope with this in Ireland? Do you have any help? Do you have any constructive thoughts? So, how well, do you? I think, you know, I I don't know. Um, the, the girls would be able to say say it better than me. But I think we are even with this play, we are we're giving a chance to look at ourselves honestly. And, and to assess it. I think we're strong enough now to do that. I don't think we would have been 20 or 30 years ago, but I think uh, there's an awful lot of our nation are standing up and looking at ourselves and, and owning the, the, the mistakes that were made and owning um, the, 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 the compensation that has to be, I mean, not just, a, not, not just financial or anything, but a mental compensation that needs to be addressed. And I think we're, we're starting to do that because we are actually, I believe we, I believe we made mistakes and we, but I think we're brave. I think we are a brave nation. I think our theatre and our literature, help us to stand up and be brave and stand together. And, and uh, you know, I mean, we, we, we've been through a lot of trauma with our, you know, the, our, 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 we have been repressed as a nation. We have, we've had famine. And as Louise says, you know, it takes nine generations for that to heal. And we have all those, we still have all those wounds in us. But, but, but this, in, this, in this modern time, with the help of Deirdre's play, with the help of um, other creative artists who are making us look at ourselves and giving us strength to be strong. I, th I believe that. I really do believe that that is what ha what's happening now. No. Yeah, but but don't you think that it might be a good idea to get um, yeah to get a structure there for 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 a younger generation to cope with it? I think the younger generation is speaking with their feet as well, Mika. You know, you think about the recent mm -hmm. you know referendums that we've had, and we've seen such such a turn in our constitution in terms of constitutional law of women's rights and bodily rights and stuff. I think we are reclaiming. I think, as Marie says, you know, the, the, the kind of cultural and theatre and literature is allowing us to cope and hold it and, and to see it for what it really is. I think plays, like such as Deirdre has written, has allowed us to peel back the plaster a little bit and just look at ourselves and go, are we ready to reef it all off and go, right, here we are, this is us, completely. Yeah. And I think that, but I think politically we are, as a young country, there's things I'm so proud of in Ireland, you know, both from the kind of marriage referendum in 2015 right through to the repealing the eighth then in 2018, I think we are ready to begin to look at ourselves, as Deirdre says, to really understand how far we've come and where we need to go to next. And I, for one, I, I'm very hopeful. When I see young women and I listen to them talking and I'm around them, I, and young men being the biggest feminists, of course, as well around, I hear, I hear lots of it and go, actually, the future of Ireland is quite say in good hands. It's in good hands. You know, they've had to cope with so much, those younger, that younger generation, the generation, uh, uh, you know, beyond, before, the ahead of us, ahead of us, people, behind us. Uh, <laughs> behind Jesus, them. both ahead and behind, uh, have, have, have had to take on so much, but they're, they're voting with their feet. They're coming back in their hundreds of thousands to come and vote and, and make an Ireland that they want to be proud of. And I think that's when we see huge change. And I think we see it in our culture, we're seeing it in our art, and we are seeing it in our political kind of system as well. Yeah, and we have lots of good comments here in the chat. Um, people really appreciate um, the, your work, all of your work. Um, do you have any reactions um, out of uh, from from the play? Not not only in this Zoom chat already. Have you talked to people who saw the play live and on, in the streaming or video on demand? And have you talked to the people who already saw this? Yes, we, we have got we have got comments back from people, but I think one of the big things is familiarity. 
yeah. our people recognize this. They, the people know about Catholicism and how, have, how ingrained it was. We've all had mothers and grandmothers, fa- grandfathers, fathers, ourselves even. Uh, my generation was very much um, um, under the spell, under the power of, of the Catholic Church just coming out of it. And I think recognition and familiarity with the subject matter that Deirdre has given us is, is one of the things people feel, oh, I know this. I mean, they might not know exactly what's happening in our play. That's been another thing. And, you know, people have said, oh, it's an old woman and she just had sex. So I know where this is going. And they don't. <laughs> <laughs> we love that. You know? We love that that, that, uh, that they, it suddenly takes them someplace where they didn't expect and into the, yeah. some part of their minds that they, they, they didn't expect to be exploring in this uh, piece of theatre, which is wonderful. You know, anyway, I'm going to stop talking now. Yeah, and I always think oh, no. that it's if you know if you if you bring people you know if you bring people to a familiar place and if you make them laugh and you make them comfortable, well then you open up their heads and their hearts. So so that when the the the, the punches come and the the complexity comes and the darkness comes they're actually, you know, they're, they're, they're just much more open to taking it on, embracing it and uh, and running with it. And I think like there's great comedy and great joy in Moira as well. And I really, you know, like as Louise said, like that really was the echo in the rehearsal room is, you know, do it for all the Moiras, <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's just, uh, you know, we're, we're kind of celebrating a survival as well, you know, and Ireland has survived and thrived and 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 looking and owning the the, the darkness and the mistakes is as much a part of that as anything else. Absolutely. Yes, it's really a celebration of uh, survivor. Yeah, really great words, Deirdre. And I would really love to see the play in Germany live. Is there any chance that you can bring this play to to us? I would love to think that there would be, um, yeah, that this is the first step in a pathway to not just, you know, to 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 Irish theatre in in terms of Germany. And um, as I said, we don't, we haven't. It's not a path that has necessarily been trodden much in the past. Um, but there's obviously a great connection between the two countries. Um, it's interesting just in terms of, you know, being able to perform in English in Germany, um, you know, and, and, and people being able to, um, you know, because this is, you know, there's some sorts of theatre that are physical or they're, you know, almost wordless or whatever, which, you know, which can tour more easily. I mean, this is a play of, of words, of ideas, of, you know, of argument, of, you know, pull and push and, you know, so it needs to be, um, it needs to be understood. Um, so, yeah, no, I think, I mean, it's wonderful to be having conversations with, 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 uh, with people in new, new countries and new territories and who knows what the next couple of years will bring. Would it be a crazy idea to adopt, to do an adaptation in German? So I Maybe. think oh, we haven't actually <laughs> we haven't actually talked we haven't actually talked about about this play, but I know that Deirdre has a play. Oh, is that's probably not supposed to say that either, Dee. Am <laughs> no, I? No, I think that's uh, announced. That play, is that announced yeah. in one of her other plays is going to premiere in Germany next year? Do you want to tell them about that, Dee? Yes, it's a play oh, yeah. that I. Uh, it's a play called Rathmines Road, and. Um, uh, well, it's another laugh out loud in that <laughs> it's uh, it's a play about a beautiful soul called Sandra who was um, was raped at a party when she was in her twenties and held that secret and and never confronted it and then when she comes home to Ireland to sell her parents' home the estate agent turns out to be. Um, the, the, a man who participated in that uh, in that um, abusive evening, and um, it was a play that I did in the Dublin Theatre Festival in 2018, and it has been translated into German by a, a lovely man called Boris. Excuse me, I can't remember his second name now, but it is going to premiere next year, uh, called Der Der Vorfel in uh, Stadt Theatre Mainz. 
and -hmm. it's going to be directed by um, a woman called Catherine Madler and she seems to be a fabulous fit for it yeah I've just had one or two emails with her but yeah that that so that's really exciting so that's kind of my my German language debut (laughs) (laughs) congratulations thank you yeah very exciting but I think I will I will um, appreciate to to always a bit better because it's your, it's your language, even if the translation is brilliant. <laughs> and talking about future plans, um, that this is nearly to the frozen yeah. again, Micah. Yeah, dear frozen. Also, because I had no reactions at all and I was talking and talking <laughs> <laughs> but talking about future plans I, I said that brings us nearly to the end of the evening because when the people are talking about future plans then it's always nearly done but um, I would like to ask you all about your future plans what's coming up next Mary um, well uh, I'm going you, to do we already heard a little bit in the beginning yes Yes. Oh, yes. The American, um, the American job is coming up in October. Hopefully, I will going well if New York stays. Uh, New York, New York's opening up again, so that'll be very exciting. But before I do that, I'm going to do a check off with Druid Theatre in Galway, and then go to America. And uh, hopefully, it's a musical music man, and it's going to be in New York. Um, it was supposed to. I'm supposed to be there right now, but COVID stopped all that, and it had to go underground for a long time. And it was, will we or won't we or can it or can it not? But apparently, everybody is feeling that it's going to go ahead now, so that'll be nice. Absolutely. What about you, Louise? Um, I'm I'm very lucky. I am about to begin development next week on a play. A little bit like Maria is saying, it's been held with a co-production with Landmark and ourselves and new productions uh, called uh, Book of Names, which we've been developing with Dublin Port, which will go ahead hopefully in the autumn time. And um, we're also writing two other plays and directing two short plays. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm writing a screenplay, which is very exciting because ah, I've never done that before. Wow. So I've got a little bit of money from Screen Ireland to develop a, a script of a play that I did a number of years ago called Hentown into a three-part TV drama. So that's very exciting too. And yeah, just looking forward to the end of the year and a big historical moment looking at the treaty debates with poet Theo Dorgan. Wow, great, great. And um, yes, thinking about performing in front of an audience, do you think it's going to be back to normal exactly in that moment when you're uh, performing? No, I don't. I don't <laughs> think it's going to be back to normal. I think, as Anne said, there's going to be a long time. I think we're going to be sitting in a hybrid form and energy. And um, hopefully we will have some live audiences um, towards the autumn time. That's my, so I have everything crossed for that to happen. And we will also try and broadcast some of it too. Um, and, and hopefully our audiences will just continue to, to get bigger and happier and vaccinated so that we can all come back together and be together. Uh, so hopefully hopefully in the next coming months. And Anne, are you working on the next hybrid production? <laughs> Indeed, I am. Thank you for asking. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm doing, I start rehearsal in two weeks time for a new play by a writer called Enda Walsh, who actually has a long history of, um, or a long relationship with German theatre. A lot of his early plays actually premiered in Germany before they premiered in, in Ireland. Um, so it's a new play called Medicine. Um, uh, it will premiere at the Edinburgh International Festival in August to live audiences. So no streaming there. There will be, at the moment, they can only have 50 people, but we're hoping it will increase. Uh, and then it's a co-production with Galway International Arts Festival. So it will then go to Galway in September, uh, where we have in-person um, audiences, uh, but also we will live stream. So um, there will be four live stream performances from Galway. So hopefully everybody who joined us for The Saviour will, will join us for that too. Hopefully, well, I think so. Uh, we, have, we have another question. Um, it's from Chrissy Poulter in, in the Zoom chat. Uh, and she said, she wrote, Dramaturg. This is a very German word, Dramaturg. 
uh, something very familiar in Germany, but newish in Ireland. What was it like for Deirdre and Louise working with a dramaturg on this? So I'll let Deirdre answer that because actually yes. it was, uh, there was a dramaturg involved at an early stage, but not in the rehearsal process, but just when, when Deirdre was writing an early draft of the play. Do you want mm -hmm. to talk about that, Dee? Yes, yeah, Deirdre? absolutely. It certainly, it is, a, it, it is a new concept in Ireland, the whole idea of a, a dramaturg. Um, well, relatively new, you know, but um, my experience has always been as a writer that I was writing to production because I was always very lucky in, in that I had my own theatre company for uh, 15 years, a theatre company called Tall Tales. And I, and I started off writing for my own theatre company. And um, so I was a writer who began and always worked closely with my director who would read every draft, who would, um, you know, play that dramaturgical role, really, you know, asking all the questions and, you know, and, and pointing out facets in the script that that might be happening subconsciously for me. So I worked with brilliant people like David Horan and Joe Mangan and Veronica Coburn uh, in that way. And then it was kind of when I when I went freelance that 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 I began to work with with, with dramaturgs, you know, and rather than the director. And it's something that I actually really enjoy. I'm very collaborative in my writing. And I really recognize that sometimes you're so in it, you can't see the wood for the trees. So thankfully, when I had pitched this to Anne, and she had commissioned it, and there's a wonderful, um, very young lady called Eleanor White, whom I had worked with in the Abbey, on a, a major adaptation of a Michel Tremblay play. And um, Eleanor uh, kind of um, worked with me on the first, at least the first two drafts, if not the first three. And I found her just brilliant to work with, particularly because when I came at this play initially, I knew Maura. I just, I just knew her inside out, you know? I knew her language. I knew her story. I knew her heart. And I wrote that big monologue fairly much in a rush. And I had that. And I had the notion of Mel and the idea of bringing Mel in and the idea of that confrontation. But I was kind of going, God, how am I going to negotiate this now? Is he going to have a big monologue? Will I have this as a big kind of monologue play? You know, can I really have 40 minutes and then do a scene or whatever? And Eleanor pointed me in the direction of a play that she had seen in New York that was similar in terms of its structure, where you had one character on stage and you really thought it was just his show and him talking about his life. And then another character came into it. Uh, excuse me, I can't remember his name. I'm always disastrous on names, but it was a brilliant play and I read it and I loved it. And I just felt, yeah, I can do this. You know, you know, kind of, you know, structurally I can hold on to the beauty of that big, you know, gush of a monologue uh, and then put it together with, with, with um, a kind of a second movement, a second scene. And, and we always referred to it. It's lovely. Like it was so it was so amazing when Louise and Marie and Brian got their hands on this play that they talked about it in the same way that myself and Eleanor and Anne had in the very early days. It is three movements. It is three sections. And then when in each one, there's different beats. Like it's almost like a score, you know? And I think that working with, with um Eleanor and um, Anne, you know, in, in writing it and unleashing it in the early days, you know, was extremely beneficial because it gave me kind of permission to, to just kind of blow apart form in a way and yet stay rigidly within one, if you know, if that makes any sense. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. We have so many nice comments here and uh, it was so, it was such an amazing conversation with you. Thank I can you. Talk yeah, for hours. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes. And um, in the end, um, I would like to thank you all. Thank you all for, for, for being with us. Thank you all for being so patient with all the questions. And I learned so much. I will thank you a lot because this was okay. really amazing. Thank you. Lovely. Thanks Lovely. very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Thank you, Micah. And yeah, I just want to repeat that. Thank you all so much. It's been such a pleasure to hear your insights. And I mean, I was blown away by the play on the weekend and I'm blown away again listening to your great minds. Um, you know, all of you just... I'm, I'm, I'm really grateful. I feel very, very privileged to um, be in your company in the Zoom tonight. And yeah, we would really like to thank you all and thank you, Micah, as well. Um, so, and also I have a lot of thanks actually now <laughs> to give. Um, so also we'd like to thank uh, the English Theatre in Frankfurt, uh, English Theatre in Berlin and the English Theatre of Hamburg. And we really look forward to visiting you all as, as soon as possible in real life. And I'd like to thank our colleagues in the General Consulate in Frankfurt, especially Niall Farrell, um, who, whose voice you heard earlier. Um, and as well as my colleagues, Milena Zeitzinger and Thomas Bellew for their help with this event. Uh, and of course, I'd like to thank uh, the ambassador for his words. Uh, so the Saviour is still available to view via Cork Midsummer Festival as video, video on demand. And we really hope that you might have a chance to see it in real life in Germany someday. I definitely want to be in one of those theater seats. Um, so do please take a look at the embassy's upcoming events and we hope you will join us again. Thank you all so much. Thank you and good night. Bye -bye. Bye. Good Bye. Abend. Thank you. Good Abend. Good Abend. Good Abend. <laughs> Bye.